It's the book club for kids. It's the book club for kids. It's the book club for kids. It's the book club for kids podcast. Hi, I'm Kitty Feldy. Who says witches and monsters and dragons have to be the bad guys? Well, that's certainly not the case in Kelly Barnhill's novel, The Girl Who Drank the Moon. Oh, that moon, it can get you into a lot of trouble. Moonlight is magic. Ask anyone you like. That's our celebrity reader, Morning Edition host, Cherry Glazer, from public radio station KCRW. The book won the Newbery Award, and it's a big hit with our readers from Woodbridge, Virginia. It's as good as the classic fairy tales like Cinderella or Snow White and the Seven Doors. It has that same kind of texture. Writer Kelly Barnhill says the book began on an ordinary day when she was out in a wooded park with her dog. And we're running and running and running, and all of a sudden I had this image in my head of a swamp monster. Uh, A four-armed swamp monster with a very long tail and wide, damp jaws and eyes that moved independently of one another, and he was holding a daisy. More about that swamp monster later in the show. This is the Book Club for Kids, the podcast where kids talk about books. We'll tell you how you could be on the show a little later on, but first, let's meet our readers. Hello, my name is Zoe. I'm a fifth grader at Rosa Parks Elementary in Woodbridge, Virginia. Hello, my name is Helen, and I am a fifth grader at Montclair Elementary in Woodbridge, Virginia. Hello, my name is Kelly, and I am a fifth grader at Montclair Elementary in Woodbridge, Virginia. This book is about a girl who gets sacrificed at a witch's house, but the witch is nice. Every year, a baby is sacrificed at her house, and she feeds them starlight. But this time, she didn't look up, and the moon was awfully big, so she fed the baby the moon. She ended up keeping the baby because the magic of the moon is far too strong to let her give the baby to the city on the other side of town. Well, let's hear a little more about the power of that moon. Our celebrity reader is a voice familiar to KCRW listeners, the host of Morning Edition, Cherry Glazer. There is magic in starlight, of course. This is well known. But because the light travels such a long distance, the magic in it is fragile and diffused, stretched into the most delicate of threads. There is enough magic in starlight to content a baby and fill its belly. And in large enough quantities, starlight can awaken the best in that baby's heart and soul and mind. It is enough to bless, but not to end magic. Moonlight, however, that is a different story. Moonlight is magic. Ask anyone you like. Zan couldn't take her eyes off the baby's eyes. Suns and stars and meteors, the dust of nebulae, big bangs and black holes and endless, endless space. The moon rose, big and fat and shining. Zan reached up. She didn't look at the sky. She didn't notice the moon. Did she notice how heavy the light felt on her fingers? Did she notice how sticky it was, how sweet She waved her fingers above her head. She pulled her hand down when she couldn't hold it up any more. Did she notice the weight of magic swinging from her wrist? She told herself she didn't. She said it over and over and over until it felt true. And the baby ate and ate and ate. And suddenly she shuddered and buckled in Zan's arms, and she cried out once and very loud. And then she gave a contented sigh falling instantly asleep, pressing herself into the softness of the witch's belly. Zan looked up at the sky, feeling the light of the moon falling across her face. Oh, dear me, she whispered. The moon had grown full without her noticing and powerfully magic. One sip would have done it, and the baby had had, well, more than one sip, greedy little thing. In any case, the facts of the matter were as clear as the moon sitting brightly on the tops of the trees. The baby had become enmagicked. There was no doubt about it. And now things were more complicated than they had been before. Zan ran her fingers through the girl's black curls. Even now, she could feel the magic pulsing under her skin, each filament insinuating itself between cells, through tissues, filling up her bones. In time, she'd become unstable, not forever, of course. 
But Zan remembered enough from the magicians who'd raised her long ago that rearing a magic baby is no easy matter. Her teachers were quick to tell her as much, and her keeper, Zosimos, mentioned it endlessly. Infusing magic into a child is akin to putting a sword in the hand of a toddler. So much power and so little sense. Can't you see how you age me so, girl? He had said over and over. And it was true. Magical children were dangerous. She certainly couldn't leave the child with just anyone. Well, my love, she said, aren't you more troublesome by half? The baby breathed deeply through her nose. A tiny smile quivered in the center of her rosebud mouth. Zan felt her heart leap within her, and she cuddled the baby close. Luna, she said. Your name will be Luna, and I will be your grandmother, and we will be a family. At the witch's house also lives a swamp monster and a perfectly tiny dragon. Their names are Glurk and Fyron, and they share experiences with the baby and the witch. I really like this, um, the character Fyron because I really think his character had like a moral behind it. It is no matter like how small you are, you are, your heart can still be huge. I really like that character. The perfectly tiny dragon, Fyron, thinks he is simply enormous. So he is always very happy, and he loves the idea of a baby living in the witch's house. The swamp monster is kind of skeptical about how the baby will turn out. Luna has a birthmark on her forehead of a crescent-shaped moon, wide black eyes, and black wavy hair, just like her mother. In the city that they all live in, they all think the witch is bad, but because they don't know that the truth is the witch is a good person, and so the witch thinks that they're just giving a baby away to die in the woods, but they're really giving it for a sacrifice. In this city, Antane, he's an elder in training, but when he realizes that his baby will be the next in line for the sacrifice, he tries to go out in the woods and kill the witch. Only later does he realize that the witch is kind and never kills any of the babies. The witch simply sends them to the other side of the forest. So tell us more about Luna. Luna um, gets older and older in the book, and in my f very favorite part, she is 13, and her magic is coming out in a brilliant shade of blue. Um, before she turned 13, there were oceans of it inside her, and when she's 13, they all escape. Why do you think that's a significant age? I mean, we're not well, maybe you guys are witches, but I'm not a witch. So what happens, I mean, is there a significance to somebody, a girl, when she hits that age if things start happening? Turning 13 is usually the start of womanhood. It's probably what the book symbolizes. Nobody likes that change very much. So when the magic comes out, that's when her, like, she kind of changes. Are you looking forward to turning 13? Not really. How come? Do you like being 10? Yes. Would you like to be 13? I mean, you're looking forward to 13? Sometimes I'm not really sure because I'm a little younger than all my friends. So I'm looking forward to being 11, but at the same time, all of my friends, they'll be 12. What do you think about being 13? Good thing? Bad thing? A bad thing because schoolwork will be getting harder. That's a good answer. <laughs> it's true. So the way that Kelly Barnhill wrote this book, there are a lot of people telling the story, a lot of different voices. Was it easy to figure out the multiple voices in this book? Definitely not. Last night, my mo mother was trying to quiz me, and she asked me who I thought that was. It took a lot of thinking. Did that make it more difficult to read the book? No, I think it added an interesting twist. Though it was a little confusing, I really liked 
and how they did that, it made it more colorful. Um, I thought it was a bit confusing, but I loved how interesting it was. And really, I didn't think it was a bad book. Not just, just wasn't the right one for me. You weren't a big fan of this. Are you a fantasy fan at all? Uh, not really. I'm more, um, realistic fiction, historical fiction. I wasn't very confused with the book, except for, as Zoe was saying, the chapters where it added in the two people in a discussion about um, the whole thing in general. And I noticed that even in that, because that's the part that's in italics in the book, even those were in more than one voice from time to time. So when did you figure out who was talking? I never figured out who was talking. I really loved um, how there was a lot of poetry in the book because I loved how there was the bog and the world and Glurk and they were all the same thing. I thought it was funny because Glurk made a big deal about how he was the poet, he was the bog, they were all the same. He's older than Earth, older than magic. I thought that was, that added a nice thing to the story. So what is it about the moon. What is the magic that comes with the moon, do you think? Because it shows up in all kinds of folk tales over and over and over again. Why do you think we're so fascinated with the moon? I'm pretty sure it has something to do with the man in the moon and how Luna might have come from that fable. Well, there is a phrase on the back that I really like. It says, there is magic in starlight, of course. This is a this is well known. Moonlight, however, this is a different story. Moonlight is magic. Ask anyone you like. And I like that a lot. It's it's pretty cool. I always think about cuz you guys are too young, but you know, I remember when we walked on the moon and what a big deal that was and how there was just this I guess we all kind of were moon crazy at some point in time. Is it a place you would like to visit at some point in your life? Definitely. That sounds so fun and cool. Not really, because there is no virtual, there is virtually no water, food, life as we know it. Of course, if I had an air tank, that would be nice, but I don't really think I'd ever want to visit the moon. I think that it would be nice to visit the moon. So you have identified this book as being a fantasy, I guess, or a fairy tale. How would you describe it? I think it's not entirely a fantasy because I like how um, there is, like, not a lot of fantasy in some parts, like the town. It's just kind of like a a normal town trying to, like, save their town from the witch. And some things are just exaggerated so much they're kind of like a fantasy, so I wouldn't really call it a fairy tale. I think it would go under the genre of fantasy, but the way it was so well written, it's as good as the classic fairy tales like Cinderella or Snow White and the Seven Doors. It has that same kind of texture. I remember one part where Anton, the young boy who wants to kill the witch, he has those scars, and how he feels about them reminds me of um, Augie Pullman in Wonder and how he feels about his face. And we should mention, in case you haven't read Wonder, you can catch up with it by tuning in to um, a different podcast, and we'll have a link on our webpage for this show so you can listen to both of those. What does it remind you of? I don't think it reminds me of anything. It was much different than anything I've ever read, but it was really good. I, I enjoyed it very much. There was one line that got me in this book, um, and it kept coming back over and over again. Sorrow is dangerous. Sorrow is dangerous. Is that a truth you guys believe, or is that just something the writer put in there? I think sorrow is not always dangerous. Sometimes it can be, because if you fill too much sorrow in your heart, you don't see what is really important, 
people can help you with sorrow. And it always feels better to like tell someone. Sorrow is only dangerous if you bottle it up and like feed on it. But if you talk to a friend or like express it, then it won't be dangerous because you don't have it anymore. A lot of people want to protect kids from sad things, from sorrow, from depressing things. Is that a, a proper response of adults, or do you think you guys are tougher than adults think you are? I think that adults shouldn't hide sorrow from kids because when they grow older, they won't be able to handle the sorrow. Adults can be too protective, but it depends on the adult. Personally, I don't like so sad things, but Helen is right. You really should be prepared in the future, though you don't have to hear about every sad thing because then you're just depressed. Our writer Kelly Barnhill says it was big questions like these that started her down the road to writing The Girl Who Drank the Moon. I had been thinking a lot about the issue of false narratives and um, and uh, and kind of fake stories. And I have a lot of friends who are in journalism, and I know that there have been, from time to time, journalists have had to take a long, hard look at themselves, uh, looking at how um, uh, how we will all accept certain storylines and we will uh, attach facts onto that, all of us assuming that it's true. And one time when people really had to uh, notice that behavior was in the aftermath after uh, Hurricane Katrina, when uh, a lot of the accepted storylines turned out to be false. And so the way that we understood the facts on the ground turned out to be false. And so this idea had been kind of spinning around and I knew that I wanted to get at it at some way, but I didn't know how. And and I was out for a run one day, and I was out for a run in this really beautiful um, wooded park in Minnesota with my dog, and we're running and running and running, and all of a sudden, I had this image in my head of a swamp monster, uh, a four-armed swamp monster with a very long tail and wide, damp jaws and eyes that moved independently of one another, and he was holding a daisy, and, uh, and he recited a poem. Uh, and this was important because I'm not a visual thinker at all. I'm an, almost entirely an aural thinker. I rarely think in pictures. And so when I do get a, uh, a really strong image in my head, I pay attention. It exhausts me, first of all, and I pay attention to it. So I, I sat there. I just stood there totally still, and I committed the poem to memory. And I ran home, and I wrote down the poem and I put it in a box. Now, all of my books start with a box. I have to think about a book for a really, really, really long time. And I wrote the poem down on, the, on, a, on just a note card, and I turned the card over, and I wrote the word Swamp Monster. And, uh, and then I wrote down, his name is Glurk. And then I put it in the box, and I thought, what is going on here? And it took me a while to realize that uh, what the doorway to this world um, that Glurk was kind of opening for me uh, was the doorway into the story that would allow me to uh, wrestle with this idea of, of, of false narratives and um, and the way in which the ways in which stories bring us together and the way in which that stories can drive us apart and how store uh, how a story can uh, do all kinds of unpleasant things like um, uh, perpetuate intolerance or um, or make people hate one another or make people not um, uh, quite question um, uh, why some people have access to, you know, food and, and um, uh, resources and whatever, and other people do not. And, um, but, but that is what had happened. So really, I can thank the Swamp Monster. Now, the poem, uh, I did not change a word of it. Uh, and it is the last poem that appears in the book, uh, The Heart is Built of Starlight and Time. Well, and you started this months and years before yes. the conversation was about exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, you know, the thing about um, uh, uh, the thing about false narratives is that it's it's nothing new. I hadn't would, would not have been able to know that that 
topic would be as relevant as it, alas, is now. Uh, but, but that has come up again and again and again. As human beings, we are apes who tell stories, right? And, uh, and, and our, our ability to use narrative is actually central to how we process and retain and organize information. And so how those narratives get, um, uh, get structured and how those narratives get passed around and how they get sticky, um, that is actually really interesting. And it is something that we, as we all have to uh, be very skeptical about and, um, and very uh, patient and analytical about so that we can understand it. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I structured the book the way that I did, where the reader has a chance to see these stories that, uh, that, you know, that some unnamed character is telling to us some unnamed child, and all of them have facts that are true to the book that the, that, the, that the reader can recognize, but all of them have been twisted around into something that is fake. And so I wanted kids to be able to see how that happens um, and, and how to notice when, um, when something that is either benign or, um, or neutral or actually really good can be twisted into something that is not. Talk to me about the moon. It's it's a theme that shows up in every culture and just keeps showing up again in, in contemporary stories. Where did the moon come in for you? Really good question. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I do know that... Um, you know, all of us feel that pull to the moon, you know, and uh, um, uh, I remember learning once upon a time, uh, you know, you learn about the tides and, and of course if you go to the ocean, we, we get to experience the tides. What a lot of us don't realize is that the whole earth has tides. You know, I live in Minnesota, I live in the center of the nation, and yet we are pulled by the tides as well. So the ground goes up and down. Uh, and and that is so, I remember learning that when I was a little kid and learning that um, uh, that if you have little tiny crabs in a little um, tank, uh, if you make a fake tide, they're not going to respond to it. They're responding to the tide that is happening underneath them. They are feeling the ground going up and down. And that, I recognize that that's science, but come on. It feels kind of magic, don't you think? We like to ask everybody one question, and that is, what is your favorite book? Oh, my gosh. And why? Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, do you have all day? Because I could list you a million favorite books. I mean, probably one of my very, very favorite books is A Wrinkle in Time, primarily because I so identified with Meg. I was I was 100% that kid when I was that age. So I, um, so that's one of my very, very favorite books. And uh, sort of right in the same league as that is Diana Wynne Jones's Howl's Moving Castle. Whenever I feel a little lost in the woods, I reread uh, Howl's Moving Castle and then I remember who I am again. What about you, Cherry Glazer? What's your favorite book? It would probably be Anne of Green Gables by L.M. Montgomery. I remember when I got my first copy. I'd never heard of the book. But when I started to read it, I just gobbled it up. It was so much fun. Even though the story was set many years before I was born, I could relate to Anne. Sure, she was smart, she did well in school, and later on she was pretty, you know, like any heroine. But she made mistakes. She had faults and shortcomings. She got into trouble. In other words, she was real. Now, I don't have that copy of Anne of Green Gables anymore. The fact is, I dropped it into the bathtub one night when I was reading it, and it got all soggy. But I've got another copy that's all beat up because I've read it over and over and over again. If you read Anne of Green Gables and you love it anywhere as much as I do, there's good news. It's the first book in a series, and there are five other books after that one that you can read. What is your very favorite book? I think one book I really liked is not Wonder, but it's the other book. It's called Augie and Me, and I really loved that book. It was one of the best things I've ever read. It wasn't really a sequel. It had different points of view of other characters in Wonder. And what I really liked about it is the first chapter, it was how um, the bully of Wonder explained his situation. And now I really thought that he wasn't all that bad. My favorite book is I Thought My Soul Would Rise and Fly. I really like the theme of the story. The author does um, 
a great job with the book and uses really good words to describe everything. My favorite book is A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Langle. I just thought it was a really good book. I read it in the beginning of the summer. It was really good. It was just so interesting. You know, you could catch me reading it anywhere because I couldn't put it down. It was so good. We'll have a list of everybody's favorite book at our website, bookclubforkids.org. And if you have a favorite book, you can be on the Book Club for Kids podcast, too. Just have your teacher, parent, or librarian contact us, and we will send out the easy instructions. All it takes is a signed permission slip and a smartphone. Email us at kitty at bookclubforkids.org. This episode is supported by the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities, which receives support from the National Endowment for the Arts. Thanks this week to Jonathan Jensen, who composed and performed our music, and Emma Steinkellner, who designed our logo. Thanks to our writer, Kelly Barnhill, and our celebrity reader, Cherry Glazer. And thanks to our readers this week, Zoe, Helen, and Kelly, and thanks to April Mendes, who organized the group. We have a free newsletter for teachers, parents, and librarians full of free tips about how to turn kids into lifelong readers. You can sign up at our website, bookclubforkids.org. And if you like the show, why not subscribe? And take a moment to tell a friend and teach them how to subscribe as well. I'm Kitty Feldy. Thanks again for listening. And if you're looking for a way to introduce civics education to your kids, check out our other podcast. It's called The Fina Mendoza Mysteries, and it follows the adventures of the 10-year-old daughter of a congressman who solves mysteries inside the U.S. Capitol and manages to teach a little bit about government along the way. That's The Fina Mendoza Mysteries wherever you listen to podcasts.